Sup chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. Well, I am proud to announce that we have some breaking news on the low-dose oral minoxidil front. This article was just published by the Journal of the American Medical Association. As you can see, it is an article on using low-dose oral minoxidil for patients with hair loss. It's what's called a consensus statement, meaning it was written by a committee of doctors. It's basically a survey of the opinions of dermatologists who specialize in hair loss and how and when to use low-dose oral minoxidil for hair loss. Longtime followers of this channel know that I have been very negative about the use of oral minoxidil for treating hair loss because I think it is overrated and I also worry very much about the risk of serious cardiovascular side effects. And I've made a series of videos on low-dose oral minoxidil, so I'll go ahead and list the playlist below. Anyways, the most serious cardiovascular side effect is pericardial effusion, which means fluid buildup around the heart, which can compress the heart and can be fatal. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now, but Kevin, that only applies to high-dose oral minoxidil, not low-dose oral minoxidil, and to that I would say you are wrong. We know this can occur with both high-dose and low-dose oral minoxidil because of published case reports like this one here. Now admittedly, it is a rare side effect, but because we don't have any prospective long-term studies of low-dose oral minoxidil, we really don't know how rare it actually is. And because of that, I don't feel comfortable as a hair loss influencer recommending it on my channel where I have thousands of viewers. If even just one one of my viewers were to suffer cardiovascular complications as a consequence of my advice, that would be one too many for me, so I can't do it. Sorry, chums. But the reality of the situation is that doctors are now prescribing oral minoxidil like water these days, especially after the New York Times published a fluff pieced article that touted the drug without showing any of its negatives. So with oral minoxidil's explosion in popularity, it's no wonder that experts in the field are trying to arrive at a consensus on how and when to use this drug. But before before we get too excited about these recommendations, it's very important to realize what this article actually is. It's not any kind of research study, it's just based on the opinion of experts in the field. Keep in mind that when ranking the quality of medical evidence, expert opinion is at the very bottom, even below case reports. So I'm not saying that this article is worthless, but we're obviously not talking about a randomized controlled study here, Jones. so nobody should treat this as gospel. What this article does do, though, is that it gives us an idea of how low-dose oral monoxide is being prescribed today by most doctors. Unfortunately, the only thing we have to go on for using low-dose oral minoxidil is expert opinion, and that's because the research on low-dose oral minoxidil is not high quality at all. All we have are some small studies suggesting that low-dose oral minoxidil may be safe, but we have no large studies proving any of that. On the other hand, we know from decades of use that topical minoxidil has been proven to be safe, and that's because its systemic absorption is negligible. That's probably why it's over-the-counter. In fact, Oral minoxidil is no longer even a first-line treatment for high blood pressure, and that's because it can cause fluid retention, rapid heart rates, and more serious side effects like pericardial fusion that I already mentioned. It can also cause angina pectoris, which is chest pain. Again, I know what you tunes are thinking right now, but given this is only applicable to higher-dose oral minoxidil prescribed for high blood pressure, not low-dose oral minoxidil, didn't you know that, bro? Well, there are a couple of problems with that. First of all, we know that oral minoxidil's most serious cardiac side effects are idiosyncratic, meaning that they aren't related to the dose of the drug. So any dosage that goes beyond a negligible dose will be equally as likely to cause serious cardiovascular side effects as the standard dose of the drug. Secondly, the reason many people use oral minoxidil to begin with is because they think it is more efficacious than topical minoxidil, but that is only true if you're using more than five milligrams per day of the drug. Five milligrams per day has been shown to be no more effective than 5% topical minoxidil at treating hair loss. And even 5 milligrams of oral minoxidil per day, which many people consider to be low dose, that's already sometimes prescribed as a standard dose for treating high blood pressure, and going beyond that would definitely be considered high dose oral minoxidil. So people who think they're taking low dose oral minoxidil oftentimes aren't really, and the people who really are taking low dose oral minoxidil aren't getting any additional benefits beyond 5% topical minoxidil. They're just exposing themselves to a greater risk of side effects. Anyways, for the purpose of this article, low-dose oral minoxidil was defined as a dose of 0.25 milligrams up to 5 milligrams per day. 
In the article, 73 experts were invited to give their opinions, but only 44 of them actually responded. That's unfortunate because it is very possible that skeptics of oral minoxidil just didn't want to get involved in this survey. In fact, if we look at the specific doctors who did respond, we see Dr. Rodney Sinclair, who was one of the pioneers of low-dose oral minoxidil, but notably absent here is Dr. Ralph Trubb, who is the scientist solarian of the hair loss industry. Dr. Trubb is also an oral minoxidil skeptic and actually published one of the case reports reports of pericardial effusion arising from low-dose oral minoxidil specifically. So that's a little suspicious, but hey, at least they didn't invite Dr. Trash. Anyways, in this article, a consensus was defined if at least 70% of the experts agreed on a particular recommendation. So what did these experts agree on? First of all, they did agree that oral minoxidil could benefit most types of hair loss, including of course the most common type, which is androgenic alopecia. That makes perfect sense because it is minoxidil after all, and we know that minoxidil works. However, I think it is very important to realize that these experts did not consider low-dose oral minoxidil to be a first-line therapy for hair loss. The expert opinion is that the gold standard for hair growth stimulants is still topical minoxidil, not oral minoxidil. They only recommended oral minoxidil when topical minoxidil caused problems. Some of these problems listed here seem reasonable, like when topical minoxidil causes local inflammation or has been ineffective. I think some of them, though, are a bit more questionable, like if topical is too expensive, which doesn't seem to be too much of a problem since topical minoxidil is a generic over-the-counter medication after all. I mean, I could buy a three-month supply from Target for like 20 US dollars. I think even a broke-ass college kid could afford that. Another indication given here is that oral minoxidil can be more effective when body hair growth is actually desired, like in specific populations such as uh, female to male transgender populations, although I think taking testosterone in that case will probably be plenty effective enough at promoting body hair growth and beard growth as well. The experts then tackle situations situations where oral minoxidil shouldn't be used, meaning when it is absolutely contraindicated. These situations include, most importantly, when people have a history of cardiovascular problems. In particular, people who have a history of pericardial disease or congestive heart failure, as well as pregnant women or women who are breastfeeding. Also, people who have a history of rapid heartbeat or abnormal heart rhythms, low blood pressure or kidney problems, they should take extra precaution if they use oral minoxidil. And you know, I've got to say that this really stood out to me, because I've noticed that oral minoxidil has become increasingly available through telehealth companies where patients will never even meet with their doctor to begin with. They'll just answer a few basic health questions online about their health history and then they'll get a prescription immediately afterwards. This really doesn't seem right to me since a lot of these contraindications we're talking about, especially those related to the heart, require an extensive in-person medical diagnosis. What telehealth companies give their patients instead is little more than an informed consent paper. And to further reinforce that point, because of the very serious side effects effects of oral minoxidil, there was a consensus that dermatologists should seek a specialty consultation either from a primary care doctor or a cardiologist before starting oral minoxidil, particularly if any of the risk factors like heart rhythm problems are present. But the harsh reality about oral minoxidil usage is that the vast majority of people who are taking the drug are not seeing any kind of specialist at all. They're getting the drug from a general practitioner or a dermatologist who do not have training in internal medicine, or they're not even seeing a doctor at all. They're buying the drug through shady gray market sources. Now to be fair, the experts did not feel that routine lab test or an electrocardiogram was actually necessary before starting oral minoxidil, unless of course there were underlying risk factors present. But of course, you also need an expert to diagnose many of these risk factors to begin with, so that's just something to ponder. So like I said, this isn't really a study, but this does still reflect how dermatologists are using low-dose oral minoxidil in the year 2024. So there are definitely limitations to this analysis. The article points out that the relatively large number of experts who chose not to participate in the survey may not have had the same opinions as those that did. That's what I was saying earlier, and it's especially disappointing because it would have been nice to get Dr. Troop's input and the input of others who are more skeptical of low-dose oral minoxidil because the fact is, is that doctors who don't use low-dose oral minoxidil because of its risk probably would not participate in this kind of survey. So the survey is extremely biased towards the opinions of doctors already using the drug in their clinical practice. So I'd say this is not a consensus opinion of all medical experts on the use of low-dose oral minoxidil. It is just the opinion of doctors who already use low-dose oral minoxidil and already have a favorable opinion about it. The article also did not look at comparing the efficacy of topical minoxidil versus oral minoxidil. It also didn't assess the long term safety of 
low-dose oral minoxidil or the use of other forms of minoxidil like sublingual minoxidil, which is disappointing. So like I said, this article is just based on so-called expert opinion, which again is at the lowest level of medical evidence. Even Rob England's scalp massage study ranks as higher tier scientific evidence than this article, and that's no joke. But even given all those flaws and biases, these experts still prefer topical minoxidil as the first line of treatment over oral minoxidil. So if you really trust their conclusions here, you should still be using topical minoxidil before considering oral minoxidil as your primary hair growth stimulant. Also, the experts here are clearly worried about the serious complications of the drug. They say that a history of pericardial effusion is a contraindication to using oral minoxidil because they know that the drug can cause pericardial effusion even when it's used at a low dose. However, what makes oral minoxidil especially risky here is the fact that most people who do get pericardial effusion after oral minoxidil don't even have a history of previous pericardial effusion. So these guidelines aren't guaranteed to prevent that complication from happening in people who are using low-dose oral minoxidil. So does this article change my opinion on oral minoxidil? No. Not at all. The fact remains that there aren't any large-scale, long-term studies of low-dose oral minoxidil. The incidence of a life-threatening complication like pericardial effusion is just not known yet, and the risk just isn't worth it when we have a perfectly safe alternative in the form of topical minoxidil. So I still don't recommend oral minoxidil on this channel. I know many doctors prescribe it, and many of my followers are on it, and I wish them all the best, and I sincerely mean that. And the same goes for any other hair loss YouTubers who are pro-oral minoxidil. I have no Nothing against you guys. Even though you guys know I'm a lefty, I am libertarian on the subject of drugs, but I really can't in good conscience recommend oral minoxidil as a safe treatment when topical minoxidil is available and it is completely free of the serious systemic side effects, especially since there are ways to get around topical minoxidil's limitations, such as by adding topical tretinoin to your stack, or by using higher concentrations of topical minoxidil, like 10 or 15%, and I have videos about that subject which I'll also link below. So I just want to give you my take on this one, Chum since I know this article is probably going to be getting a lot of exposure on social media if it hasn't already. But I'll be back with more hair loss witchery in the near future because I've got a lot more interesting content in the pipeline. So thank you all so much for watching Hair Loss Witchers. I'll see you all next time. God bless.